All right, so thank you everybody for coming to our third installment of the Traffic Flow webinars. Today is my great pleasure to introduce one of the great pioneers in our community, Jean-Patrick Lebec. He is a general engineer of the French Ministry of the Ecological and Inclusive Transition, currently working on the Grecia Laboratory of the University of Gustave Eiffel, where he has been the director for the last 10 years. He is a professor at the ENTPE, um, one of the two leading French higher education institutions for civil engineering, <coughs> and the EIVP, uh, the School for Engineers in Paris, all right? And he has also taught in the ENPC, École Nationale de Ponts et Chaussées, and at the University of Paris East. His research interests focus mainly on traffic and multimodal transportation modeling, with a special emphasis on large networks and on the impact of information and connectivity. They also include dynamic assignment and micromobility. So, Again, it's my great pleasure to have Jean-Patrick, and without further ado, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Roche, and thank you for your kind invitation. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to uh, make this uh, presentation in this uh, webinar. Um, okay, so uh, my, uh, the topic of my talk today Today is a continuum 2D uh, models for very large networks. Uh, so this has been an ongoing preoccupation in my lab for a while, and I'm going to uh, dwell on this a little bit later. Uh, so the outline of my presentation is uh, following, well, it's very standard. So first I'm going to make an introduction and giving some elements of uh, context, and motivation, background. Um, then I'm going to go into uh, the model. Actually, this um, modeling uh, direction has been going on uh, for a while uh, at the lab where I'm working. And um, I think we have, uh, at the beginning, been very interested in some model which we call anisotropic. And so I will uh, describe more precisely what it is. But so this is the first element that I want to describe. Then I will describe some more general uh, modeling uh, venues. And also, uh, I'm going to discuss something which I feel is extremely important for these uh, 2D models, which is um, how actually to um, input data. For example, geometric data, characteristics of uh, infrastructure, and so on. How can we? put this into the model, how can we retrieve it from actual uh, network data? This is a non-trivial problem. And so finally, I'll make some concluding remarks. Well, uh, let's go uh, first uh, on the motivation. Uh, so um, from, a, from an institutional point of view, what we uh, see is that uh, major cities, for example, in France, I would say Paris or Ireland, London, and so on. Uh, regional authorities, um, all of these uh, are taking more and more responsibilities. Actually, they are taking over some of the responsibilities that were previously carried by states. And so uh, they have, uh, they accept now to deal with lots of concerns, for example, uh, economic concerns, environmental, environmental issues, also the issues of uh, transportation externalities and so on. And so from their point of view, they definitely have a need for large scale uh, transportation system management. They need to make decisions at a regional level. They want to do planning, they want to assess uh, things uh, ex ante and ex post. Uh, so this is the uh, institutional point of view. Now, if we look at the transportation system, what we see is uh, that there is more and more interconnection between various uh, subsystems in the, in the system. Basically, we have uh, systems of systems that are emerging. Uh, there is a large-scale communication, which means that uh, essentially, for example, uh, 
through some uh, applications, uh, drivers can be informed in real time of what's going on at the other end of the network. So this, of course, will impact their choices and therefore they will make decisions on this. So basically, you cannot anymore consider network as uh, something where information propagates very slowly from vehicle to vehicle, at least within the uh, this within a distance that corresponds to what you can see. Actually, now you get information from a very long distance, and so everything is interconnected. And of course, well, these uh, networks are very complex, so this is some issue too. Well, so um, among motivations, uh, another motivation I would like to mention, it was uh, one of the real basic motivations of our own work is dynamic traffic assignment, actually uh, a regional um, institution and regional planning organizations are interested in this and so they're asking us and so we're thinking about it so what are the challenges basically one challenge is the network complexity like large networks have enormous quantities of links of ODs and so on and so uh, there's a problem of computational tractability also there is a problem pro problem with data what data is available, do we have enough data actually to feed models, especially dynamic models? This is not obvious. And finally, more and more, we have what we call a vehicular multimodality, that is to say that actually the road infrastructure is shared by not only private cars, but also taxis, buses, demand response systems, and so on. So actually, you have several modes that share this infrastructure. Well, all in all, uh, what do we want? Well, we want uh, models to treat all of this that are fast, efficient, parsimonious, macroscopic, hopefully, and um, that uh, basically also can deal with another point I will dwell on, which is the fact that networks are not homogeneous. Um, well, simply to give you an example of complexity, uh, so here on the right, uh, the image you see actually at different scales, uh, Madrid, and so uh, basically uh, you see as uh, when you look at it from a great distance, it seems relatively uh, simple. And actually, when you get close into the when you zoom into the city, then it becomes extremely intricate with enormous quantities of links. Um, on this same slide uh, at the bottom, actually what you see is the in the France region so uh, the scale, scale is a little bit uh, misleading it's about uh, 100 kilometers in width right 12 million people and uh, so this is actually an image of a standard network that is used that's only major arteries so that's about the 38,000 of these guys this is uh, used in a program that's called the Mobus, uh, which is developed by uh, DRIOA. I'm coming back to this a little bit later. Well, also, a word about uh, traffic measurements. Uh, that's a big issue. Uh, well, classical uh, Eulerian detectors, uh, well, are well known, they're loops and so on, cameras and so on. They are fixed. They have a good side, which is that they give us uh, the kind of information we like like for example they give us flows uh, so idea of uh, densities and stuff like this uh, the problem is there are too few of them uh, typically in ile de france area which i'm very interested in there are only uh, say uh, at best one every 500 meters on actually motorways but otherwise uh, you don't have any now there is uh, the lagrangian data like uh, whatever is related to vehicles, say floating car data, GPS, whatever. Okay, what does this give us? It gives us uh, trajectories, uh, velocities, travel times, which is uh, well. But now to feed the model, then you still have to access to flows and uh, densities. So there is some work to be done. Another point is that they're extremely expensive. So for typically uh, in France, uh, major cities will make a campaign every year or so for a few weeks no more. 
So this is a very important point. Just an example, which I like a, lo a lot, which is due to Oplatner a few years ago, uh, which is an image of uh, San Francisco, basically um, as retrieved from a taxi data. And that's for a day. And so you see that actually the, um, uh, the data is kind of, um, it doesn't give a complete uh, picture of the of the network, even over a full day. Uh, basically, this means that even once we use the streaming data, we may not be able to retrieve data for complete networks. Well, so uh, the idea of continuum two uh, D models is basically uh, to make uh, models that are simple, because so we can calculate them fast. And also, they won't need too much data. Basically, hopefully, they won't need uh, more than actually uh, we are able to provide to feed the model. And um, one very important uh, issue is that actually networks are not homogeneous. Basically, there are areas that are extremely dense with small streets and so on. And there are also major infrastructures like uh, highways and so on and so uh, we have to um, uh, we have to distinguish between the two but now for the part that is very dense small streets not very high flows actually we would like to have something that would give us a very approximate view and this is basically what we are trying to do and uh, in these areas which are small streets and so on, what we're trying to do basically is to um, have global flows and uh, indeed actually to kind of substitute for missing data in the street network to have an idea of what's happening there without going too much into the details. Um, well, um, if uh, we want to give a kind of a definition of a 2D a continuum model for a dense network, what is it? It's basically the result of a double approximation process. Uh, one uh, part is to approximate the physical network by a two-dimensional medium. And the other one is to take the flow and the links of this network and to approximate this by a two-dimensional flow. So actually you have uh, two, uh, two levels of approximation. Okay, a, a tiny, uh, I, w I wouldn't dare call it a literature review because the literature on this topic is starting to be uh, quite abundant. And so uh, these are mainly kind of uh, my stepping stones in the, the flow of this uh, growing literature. Um, so I would like to start actually with a very old piece paper, but I like this paper a lot. It's a paper by Taguchi and Iri. Um, well, I will go back on, uh, I will go back on this paper a little bit later. But then there has been uh, for quite a while um, a field of research uh, that aiming uh, first to make uh, static models with uh, essentially uh, uh, one density basically to consider quite an isotropic uh, network of static circumstances and um, essentially locally a single density to describe uh, traffic. Uh, so this was started with a paper a long time ago by Yang and uh, Yagar and Ida and also by Wong and uh, this work has been actually uh, still going on. Uh, then, curiously, the um, good pedestrian approaches. Well, that's kind of logic. Really, uh, to model uh, macroscopically a uh, pedestrian flow, you have to make a 2D model. And so, unsurprisingly, the 2D models developed for pedestrian are very close to the 2D models that you find in the vehicle traffic flows. And so, here I put a few. Uh, a few references, uh, notably, for example, the one by Hughes, which I would say is probably a uh, basic paper in this. Uh, well, then, uh, this is an um, outgrowth of the static uh, 
approach, then the people thought, okay, since we are making nice uh, public models uh, on networks that are static, why not make them dynamic? And so uh, since then, there has been uh, lots of uh, work on this. Um, starting probably with uh, Jung and Al. I will go back to this one also a little bit later. And uh, the, the last one I noticed is one uh, by Mulli and Al, and also, I'm also going to come uh, back to this model a little bit. Now, there has been a huge uh, growing literature on the MFD approaches uh, in this field with uh, lots of things are not only um, developments, uh, not, notably uh, multimodal MFD, for which I mentioned a few uh, uh, references. Uh, most of them are pretty uh, recent, so I tell you, you can feel that this is a growing, uh, growing action. And also, uh, not surprisingly again, uh, MFD and pedestrian, uh, applied to pedestrian flows. Uh, well, and so uh, finally here I put a few uh, references on our own uh, line of work, uh, starting with the anisotropic uh, static model and going on to uh, isotropic and multimodal. Well, uh, this is uh, a very short, uh, very short review. I just wanted to uh, give you some elements from two of the answers. The first is Kagushi and Iria. I think it's very interesting because actually this, uh, they were interested in uh, solving uh, operations research and uh, problems on very large networks, like say, macro problems, shortest uh, path, and stuff like that. And so uh, they decided that for very large networks, it made sense to uh, try to adopt a continuum approach. And what is very interesting in their approach is that they actually uh, propose to um, uh, to start from the physical substratum, from the actual physical network, and uh, go up to the local properties. For example, by introducing the velocity, what they call velocity convexes, capacity convexes. Without going into the detail, intuitively you can feel what it is all about. It says, well, in certain direction, you have lots of capacity at any given point, but uh, in other direction, you have none, and so uh, you kind of do this. And so I tried to illustrate this by two images from the paper on the top right of this uh, slide, where actually you can see the kind of capacity uh, convexes you get from, like, say, a network with a triangular uh, uh, periodic uh, links. Okay, another one I wanted to comment because uh, this actually gives you an idea of what the uh, uh, isotropic models are all about. So it's the model of uh, Jung, which is uh, the first one. So it's kind of uh, basic and it's easily understood. Um, so uh, the the first thing to be said is that at any given point, uh, they assume there is a density. So this density, which is a function of time, is a function of position and so on. Except you have to imagine it's a position in two dimensions on a plane. And so then you have a, a conservation equation for this density, which is uh, the equation in blue, which is in the middle. Uh, so, uh, well, here you are. Everybody recognized that's a standard conservation in physics. Uh, well, then um, the uh, the equation in uh, in yellow it tells you more or less that um, the velocity is related to the density by some kind of a fundamental diagram. To be precise, it's the length of the velocity because the velocity here is actually a vector, so it's the length that is. Um, of, uh, that is related to the to the density, and so uh, finally, uh, so since they were interested in uh, problems of assignment, there is also a concept of a local uh, travel cost. That is to say, how much does it cost you to go from one point to another point? And so, basically, uh, this uh, travel cost is uh, expressed in terms of the density. 
So as you see it uh, in also velocity, as you can see from the equation, this one is in green on this slide, um, you can see that it depends on the density and on the modulus of velocity only. This is why it's an isotropic model. You have, uh, it makes no, um, doesn't, it makes no difference which direction you are going in, essentially. And so, for example, if you have an assignment problem, uh, then you are going to look at the shortest path according to this uh, speed constant. Well, that's more or less in a nutshell the idea of these models, and uh, this gives you a, a basic structure for all uh, other models, including pedestrian models that are more or less built on this, uh, on this pattern. Uh, so. Um, Yes, another item I wanted to mention. Yeah, reference a review of all uh, DT, um, of all uh, There are many of them, so there are like Agama, Mohammed, and Talabal. And finally, I would like to mention a paper of Muni et al. Uh, which is quite recent and which illustrates a uh, point that to me is very important when you do 2D modeling, uh, which is that essentially if uh, flows are into a two dimensional model, uh, they're essentially on links. So this is illustrated by the bottom right uh, caption. So I'm trying to put my uh, arrow on it so that you may uh, see which one it is. And so the question is uh, now, uh, if you want to make uh, an approximation of this, that would be okay for a bi-dimensional model, for example, of the kind uh, that I described on the previous slide, the John, uh, then you have to get some, uh, you have to approximate uh, all these flows on those links by a global flow that is locally here oriented from uh, uh, southwest to northeast, say. And so they proposed a kind of a projection procedure that tried essentially on the uh, drawing that is on the right top of this uh, slide. So without going on the details intuitively, basically they're making a kind of a projection of the, of the flows. And uh, well, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, one solution to a very uh, important this slide, uh, just to give an, a tiny example of uh, anisotropy, uh, so I'm mainly uh, so on top that is uh, Paris, and so basically it's extremely dense, like there are about 10,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, something like that. And um, well, in yellow, you can see uh, the major arteries, and actually, there are still uh, quite a few. Now, if you go at the uh, Ile de France uh, area, which is uh, about right and so in, um, so in green uh, it's the forest but now in um, say orange uh, there you have uh, the densely populated area those would be uh, good candidates for 2d model and um, in uh, in red uh, you have the major arteries and you can see that you have a lot of them and so you basically you absolutely need to take them into account well, this is it. So I'm going to move on now to um, the static uh, bidimensional isotropic case. And so um, essentially the uh, our reflection uh, started from the point of view, from the point that we didn't want to have uh, uh, something that was isotropic. We felt it didn't always make sense that if, for example, you had a network that was a grid of roads that were like the one depicted on the bottom left here, that you needed to take this into account in some way. And so uh, this is uh, this is what we tried to do in the first uh, part, uh, classical uh, assignment. Uh, so basically uh, what happens if you have uh, a network like this, you can actually uh, consider that you have uh, four directions uh, that are privileged in the network where you can actually uh, travel. 
even the other ones that are not really used. Uh, so basically, um, uh, what we used this concept for was to do a classical assignment. And so uh, essentially what happens when you consider such a model is that, um, okay, in certain directions you can define a proper cost and in other directions you don't. And so um, when you take this into account, you can calculate, for example, static assignment. This is illustrated by the uh, formula, which is uh, on the bottom right, with, on which I'm just going to make a tiny comment. For those of you who are used to assignment problem, they will immediately recognize what it is. Basically, it's the cost of formation of the equilibrium uh, in a kind of a Beckman uh, approach. And so uh, basically we have uh, local costs, but uh, so these costs are actually uh, depend on some uh, uh, direction. And also the flows are basically uh, projected on the um, privileged directions. Uh, so um, this allowed us to take into account the fact that they are privileged direction of uh, flow. Uh, the resolution of that kind of problem is kind of difficult because uh, you um, have to add capacity constraints, you have to have a flow conservation. Actually, we considered many origins, many destinations, so actually the previous formula was disagreed, disaggregated with respect to those. Uh, so basically, you have to optimize the criterion with constraints which are divergence equal to zero for conservation and capacity, so it's kind of um, difficult. So we did it using some um, uh, numerics and uh, on uh, free fem plus plus, which is a uh, finite uh, element uh, software. And so the um, uh, illustration here on this slide uh, is uh, Paris. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's just an exercise actually. Uh, so we looked at what, uh, how uh, would the traffic propagate uh, when the, the load was uh, from east uh, towards west. Uh, in the middle, there is a white area. That's the River Seine with the major bridges on it, which are in color. And so the uh, colors uh, yield actually the density of uh, of flow given the origin of the of the flow. And well, as you can see there, this was calculated making a, a using standard uh, numerics uh, with finite elements and um, with the discretization that is done there, which doesn't take into account at all the structure actually of the underlying structure of the network, which is not very well uh, recaptured here. Well, the next, next uh, slide, uh, right, uh, um, adapt this model uh, in the dynamic uh, dynamic case, which means that then uh, we would have on the various links, we would have densities. Uh, so for example, if you look at the east, uh, at the west-east and uh, east-west links, then you would have uh, on each of them uh, two densities, one for the vehicles traveling to eastwards, one for the vehicles traveling to westwards. And then at the entry of the, um, this cell, uh, you would need to calculate uh, inflows. And basically, uh, this is actually not too uh, difficult conceptually because uh, you can easily imagine that these uh, links are well defined and so that each of them has a fundamental diagram. Therefore, if you know the densities, you can calculate supplies, you can calculate demands, and then you can actually calculate flows. Well, this is more or less uh, described by this uh, slide, uh, which uh, the details of which I'm not going into, except uh, to, re to make uh, two important comments on this. Uh, what is the, the formula all about? Basically, it's a conservation of the number of people who travel from west to east. So it's the direction we had looked at in the first slide. But then if you look at the, uh, so this is a time discretization, and that, then if you look at the equation, what can you notice so that we calculate the number as time 
T plus delta T and compare it with the number of vehicles at time T, always for the vehicles which go from the west to east. And actually, uh, in this formula, we have uh, certain elements which are normal, for example, which depend on the way we do use the geometry. That's why you have some angles in it. This is not surprising, uh, but you have something more important. You have some gamma coefficients. What are those? Uh, those are actually assignment coefficients, uh, which is to be that in this model, if you have to keep track vehicles that enter, for example, in the direction uh, east may not exit in the same direction, but actually they may turn inside the cell and, for example, exit southwards that's the direction two, or northwards, that's the direction four. And so you have to take uh, this into account. Well, uh, this uh, just to illustrate uh, this uh, concept I uh, mentioned uh, before, uh, that is to say that from a behavioral point of view, actually what we do here is simply to take uh, each link uh, to say that each link has a fundamental diagram and therefore that on this link you can calculate local supplies and demands and then you can calculate flow. So actually here the um, supplies are in orange and uh, the demands are in green and so from say if you go from the cell that is uh, down to the cell that is up here and you want to calculate the flow Q2, basically you will compare uh, the demand that is here and the supply that is there and that will give you the flow and so on. Well, essentially uh, this, uh, this gives us the idea so to try to retrieve some behavioral law from actually uh, what was happening in the intersections so I will not comment uh, this uh, slide because actually uh, we are going back to this kind of behavioral law a little bit later in the presentation. Well, if you make the model, uh, if you look at the dynamic model as a full, I will comment in the slide mainly what the picture that is on the left and on top. Uh, basically, the network is divided into cells, so each cell is uh, related to four neighboring cells. So this is, of course, valid only in the cities where you have uh, east, west, west, east, north, south, and south, north uh, streets. And so um, we won't look into the formulas, but essentially now if you look at, uh, for example, the flow formulas, uh, the formulas that uh, describe the flow that goes from one cell to the next one. So for example, here flow uh, Q1, basically uh, it will be the minimum between the demand of the cell it goes out and the supply of the next cell, at least for that uh, precise direction. And so uh, the four lines that describe all the different um, uh, density dynamics, uh, basically, uh, if you look at them carefully, you will recognize again the assignment coefficients and so on. But the idea of all of this is relatively uh, straightforward. Well, uh, here I will start going into a more recent recent part of um, our research, uh, which concerns the networks that are kind of mixed. And so, um, uh, to illustrate my point, um, I took this uh, picture. Basically, it's a tiny area in Barcelona. And so, um, what do you notice here in this? Uh, when you look at this picture, you can look that um, basically, um, on the top of the uh, on the top of the city and also on the right side of the city, uh, you have streets that uh, form a very structured network, exactly like what I talked about in the previous slides. Uh, that is to say, you have a, a network of uh, parallel streets in uh, both directions. And then, uh, if you look at the bottom and the left of the photograph then you see that you have an area which is uh, formed of uh, 
pretty dense network, and this one is uh, pretty much uh, not unstructured. Which means that if you wanted to make a model of uh, this city, you would have actually to distinguish uh, two kinds of cells. Uh, some that would be uh, anisotropic, that is to say with privileged direction of travel, for example, uh, this one here on top. And then you would have to uh, distinguish isotropic cells, that is cells where actually you can distinguish no privileged direction of propagation. And well, uh, then uh, you have to take uh, this uh, both into uh, account. And now another point uh, um, that we were also interested in this uh, line of modeling was to, of course to consider these two cases for the dense networks and also this time to add to add the um, a structuring infrastructure like the major highways, roads, and so on, and which would be modeled by first order microscopic model of the, in our case of the GSOM. Uh, well, um, uh, what are the, the guiding ideas for the two uh, PD models? Uh, well, the first one is uh, we wanted to have flows from many to many. We didn't want to aggregate uh, vehicles with respect to their density or eventually also with respect to other attributes. Now, if you look at the, um, the network, so we want to discretize it into cell. Uh, we want also to uh, discretize time into time steps. Typical orders of magnitude would be for the cells about cell size about one uh, to five kilometers, say, uh, for time step uh, one to five minutes, and for the population, say, 10,000 to um, 1,000 to 10,000 inhabitants. Now, uh, how do we model uh, cells? And so, uh, for well, people who are thinking of uh, MFD, for example, uh, here there is a uh, um, significant uh, difference in point of view. What we wanted to know was, of course, to have flows between cell, what we call intercell flows, but also what we call intracell flows. For example, we want to say that if a cell comes from, a, say, H and goes to G and uh, passes through C, we want to be able to uh, know about the number of vehicles that are actually uh, doing this and that are in the process of uh, doing this and to keep uh, track of them. And so this is uh, what we call intracell flows. Now, of course, the model has all these models. We have the conservation laws for vehicles, so both uh, at the cell boundaries, but also inside cells. Um, now another point is that we want to retrieve uh, the macroscopic cell properties from the network properties themselves and basically uh, so fundamentally ingredient will be uh, the fundamental diagram of links and then also we add the geometry of the network and so with this we may be able to calculate the supplies demands and so on and so basically what we would like to calculate typically, for example, would be uh, demands at boundary, like it is uh, here to go from C to J. Uh, we would like to have supplies at boundary, for example, to go from H to C. And we also want to have internal supplies and demands for whatever happens inside the cell. Well, if I illustrate it, uh, this is uh, how it goes. So uh, here the um, Polygons uh, are actually the cells. At the middle, they have the centroids. So the dashed lines go globally, it uh, gives you a uh, uh, symbol for flows that go from one cell uh, to another. And so uh, here, the green arrows in one of them uh, cells uh, gives you actually an idea of this um, intracell flows uh, that we're interested in. Whereas the red arrows gives you an idea of the intercell uh, flows that we consider. Well, this is how it looks in theory. 
Yeah, so the practice is uh, quite different actually. So this is an example. This is the modus uh, zoning. So modus, as I told you, is a static assignment program that is used by the DRIOA, which is one of the important agencies in Egypt organizing transportation and so uh, they have made a pretty uh, refined uh, zoning which is uh, illustrated uh, for example by the uh, image which is on the right uh, left here and so uh, basically uh, all these names are actually what we call communes uh, so essentially uh, they're, they're all of them are cities uh, which are just next to one another here you have Eucla, Marsh, and so on uh, so these zones are kind of uh, actually uh, small uh, because they were based on uh, uh, census data. And so now if we want to make a cell, usually we have to regroup a few. And so uh, we have shown you uh, here on this slide what it gives. And so uh, the uh, red uh, line on this right uh, shows you how we regroup um, some uh, four of these modus zones in order to make actually a cell for a macroscopic bidimensional model. So these cells are not uh, as uh, nice uh, pentagons or hexagons as what I uh, showed you on the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on the theory part. Uh, actually, this is how they really should look. Well, uh, that's it. So. Um, Basically, uh, what are the principles of this uh, model? Uh, so the model essentially it's a phenomenology. Done in two steps of uh, actually calculating uh, equations, uh, the PDs that were related to this uh, that could express this model at the microscopic level. So essentially, it's uh, phenomenological. So uh, we have uh, cell dynamics, we have cell densities, and so on. Uh, we um, disaggregate uh, flows and density per destinations, and so on, etc. So the main variables are the number of vehicles, and the number of vehicles are actually distinguish. As I uh, told you, basically, we are looking at. Um, for example, the vehicles that enter a cell, so we would be interested by the number of vehicles that have been entering the cell from H to C, and so on. Uh, so this is what we call actually a local OD. Then we would like to know which of these guys are going to go out uh, to uh, J. This is what we want to keep uh, track of. So we need to associate the densities, and uh, to calculate densities, we need to have some um, uh, link length. And so this, this is one of the difficulties. And if I have time, I will try to go back. Well, intercell dynamics are actually very straightforward because what do you do if you want, for example, at uh, how many vehicles go from H to C? What do you do? Well, essentially, you look at which infrastructures cross the boundary between the two. What's the capacity? And then you calculate on each side uh, some um, supply on the C side, some demand on the H side. And then you basically you say, well, the flow that goes from H to C, the minimum between that demand and that supply. Well, this is a relatively a straightforward uh, procedure. Internal flows are more tricky. Uh, so uh, what are the ingredients to calculate uh, internal flows? Essentially, what we want to be able to do is um, now to know we have some uh, vehicles which are inside here that have come uh, into from uh, H and uh, that will, uh, will be going to some destination, local destination J. And so we want to uh, basically to dispatch the vehicles that have come in from H uh, towards uh, J. All the, the possible local destination J's, that is to say, our local downstream cells. Well, what do we need for as uh, far as ingredients go? Well, first thing is uh, we need to calculate the demand for this kind of 
So this is the delta. Then we need to calculate some supply. So it's a supply for this um, vehicles that want to go out uh, towards trade. And then we need to make an assignment. So what are the agreed ingredients? Well, one ingredient is actually that here we absolutely need to have some information on the assignment, that is to say, on some kind of a global path choice. We need to know how many people who have entered from H want to go out through J. These are the gammas that figure here. And so finally, all of this is not yet enough. This gives you a certain range for the flows, and but that's not enough. And so in order to actually those, then we propose actually to have some kind of a maximum principle. Actually, we do not maximize flows because this is probably uh, incorrect. Actually, what we typically maximize, uh, we'll go back to this later, is some kind of uh, concave flow that expresses a maximum uh, principle for this uh, assignment inside the cell. Well, uh, the idea basically comes uh, from uh, pointwise point intersection modeling, uh, and um, which is a kind of an old idea, actually. Here I put a few references. I would say the first instance of this kind of stuff is probably a uh, Holden Rispo. Actually, uh, we studied this in 2005 for LWR. And if you look at some uh, quadratic function, Actually, you retrieve, for example, Daganzo's merge model. Uh, well, this means uh, the quadratic function is pretty good as uh, to implement in the maximum uh, uh, principle for intersection, and uh, we have a, a long tradition of uh, doing this. Uh, just uh, sorry, I go back to this. Uh, Actually, there is one important point is that if you consider pointwise intersection models like this and you consider periodic networks, actually you kind of justify that this carries over to a whole cell. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an important thing. Also, I forgot to mention yet that you have a CFL uh, condition like in all uh, macroscopic models, that is to say that you are a cell size has to be related to the time step uh, via the velocity uh, in, the, uh, in travel velocity inside the cell. Well, anyway, so let me go back to the global cell dynamics. So you have uh, two kind of conservation equations. You have those uh, that uh, pertain to what is entering and exiting the cell. And then you have what is pertains to the movement inside the cell. So this is more or less uh, here the uh, magenta flows. Where, so the intercell uh, is the blue flows on this uh, illustration. Well, basically, uh, then you make uh, the conservation equations themselves. Uh, carry no uh, mystery, whatever. What I want to need to mention is that all of this is easily disaggregated per destination. Okay, so uh, since I have a little bit more time, so I'm gonna go to um, uh, very fast some special cases. Um, of uh, uh, One case is, um, now, with this uh, general framework, do we retrieve, uh, for example, the special case, for, case of anisotropic cells? Well, actually, very easily. Actually, uh, it is a simplification. It's not only a special case of the previous model, but it's actually a simplification. Because uh, what uh, does happen, uh, let's consider, for example, the figure in the middle, right? So, so let's consider uh, cell C. So if in this cell there are privileged uh, directions, for example, um, east, west, uh, north, south, and uh, vice versa. Uh, so for example, in the east-west couple, that gives us two uh, privileged direction, I and J. And so uh, all you need to do is to take the vehicles that, uh, that enter, say, from H, and the vehicles that on, exit on J, and basically to consider to add those vehicles up. So this gives you the 
this gives you essentially the directional uh, the data that pertain to the direction of flow in the direction uh, i so this is actually a very straightforward so essentially uh, basically what happens is you uh, for this anisotropic cells actually you reduce considerably the number of uh, variables and the quantity of things that you need to calculate actually you don't need to uh, you need to bother of course with the um, intra flows regrettably because actually this i mentioned already uh, you still have uh, people who, uh, for example, come from uh, H and will go southwards instead of going to J, and you have to keep track of them. So you're still obliged to calculate this uh, intra flows, but also this part is uh, much simpler than uh, the general case. Well, so this works out. Uh, this works out fine. Uh, something that also works out fine is: uh, can we interface the uh, 2D model with a 1D model. Well, uh, this is uh, true too. It's absolutely crucial because, as I've repeated many times, we want to uh, be able to distinguish the major arteries. It makes no sense to have them, uh, to include them into the 2D model. Uh, so, uh, how do we do it? Basically, uh, we discretize, of course, then we have, a, say, a cell C for the 2D model. And then here on the left of the cell, we have a major infrastructure, I call it A. And so we also divide it into cells of S and S. And so basically, what are you going to do? You're going to do, of course, conservation of A to Z. Well, then you calculate flows between cells. So uh, you have uh, flows that you will calculate between cells of the same family, for example, 2D to 2D cell, you have uh, will have 1D to 1D, for example, vehicles going from S minus 1 to S. And you have also flow between 1D and 2D, for example, you will have um, sharing of vehicles between, say, S minus 1 and C, or S and C, and so on. Uh, well, those are the things that you actually need to address. This is actually what is this. Um, well, you have to note that actually the time steps are quite different, as uh, actually my drawing suggests, the cells for the uh, 1D infrastructure, say the motorway, are much smaller than the cells for the 2D models, uh, basically by one order of magnitude. Typically, the cells S will be of, uh, say, 500 meters, whereas the uh, cell C will be a few kilometers. So. Uh, the time steps will be correspondingly different, and there is some attention to be paid to this aspect. Well, how does it work? Well, here I refrain from writing some equations. So basically, just to make a tiny drawing. Uh, so if you consider, for example, cell uh, S minus 1, what happens is you have to consider traffic flowing in from the previous cell, traffic flowing towards the cell S, and also here, I assume there was traffic flowing into the cell C. Uh, well, basically, that would be, for example, an off-front uh, TPT. And then uh, the next cell, you have a cell flowing in from S minus well. You have flow flowing towards the next cell, and you have flow flowing in from the uh, macro cell uh, C. Uh, basically, uh, so uh, technically, uh, essentially, uh, you will consider S minus 1 uh, Diverge and S as a merge. And uh, you will consider then the various supplies and demands as uh, need be, and uh, as you usually calculate them. So actually, this is relatively uh, straightforward. Well, I, now I would like to um, look at a difficult problem, which is actually how to retrieve uh, the necessary information to give, for example, microscopic characteristics of uh, cells, those uh, that are needed to calculate the uh, supplies, to calculate the demands, and so on. So uh, if you look at um, the intercell flows, actually it is uh, relatively straightforward, and so this is illustrated by the picture which is on 
button on the left here. And so uh, basically we consider a cell, uh, this one is an hexagon. And so the dense network inside is in green. You have some major arteries like motorways which cross it, uh, which are here in red, so you have them crossing, the, uh, uh, crossing this, uh, this cell. And so uh, what should we consider if we want to calculate the interflows, that is to say the flow between this cell and the cells that are next to it? Well, basically what we have to consider is all the infrastructure that is at the border. So this is the infrastructure that is here dep depicted in white. And so this is actually the infrastructure that we take into account to calculate the supplies and the demands and to actually calculate the flows. This cell here and between its uh, neighboring cells. Uh, so here we have a relatively uh, simple procedure. Uh, now, to, if we want to calculate um, intra-zone flows, like uh, intra-cell flows, excuse me. Um, so this is a little bit more difficult, and so are the um, uh, the procedure that we um, that we suggest is actually a procedure which is based on an on the idea that is illustrated by the picture down there on this slide. So here we have a um, hexagon uh, size uh, shaped cell, and basically we are considering traffic that enters from H that goes towards P that passes C. And so first thing is uh, now we are interested in the infra flow, the flow that is uh, here depicted in magenta, basically that is going to go from H to J to uh, C. And so first thing is uh, what is going to be the demand of this, uh, of this flow. And so in order to uh, do this, we are basically going to try to have some kind of, uh, of a cut inside the cell that gives us an idea of where uh, what is actually the crucial part of that network for this kind of flow. And if you look at the supply, we'll also try to make a kind of a cut inside the network to see, uh, this is illustrated by this green uh, dashed line, uh, to see uh, what uh, where's uh, the crucial part of the network that is concerned with the exit. So as you can see, for example, I put a note uh, to, to compare with Molly et al. Uh, that I described at the beginning. This is a quite a different point of view uh, than uh, that paper, but which actually addresses the same uh, the same concern. Uh, so essentially, what we propose to do is uh, the following: it is actually to solve uh, some. Uh, mean cut max flow are problems to find uh, these uh, cuts in the, um, in the cell. Uh, the very important point is that this is actually something that you can do offline. And so uh, these, are the, um, uh, these are the places where actually we will uh, really calculate, take into account the elements that will give us the supplies and demand for the calculations of the uh, intra flows. Okay, uh, just uh, one tiny uh, note about this competition um, functions that allow us to dispatch, uh, to, to say how the uh, flows are assigned uh, inside a cell. So basically we propose essentially to use uh, quadratic functions like the ones that are depicted here. Uh, so essentially you can see that this uh, Functions are parameterized by the maximum of flows that are concerned, that are actually given by the supply and demand functions. So this is how we uh, we do it, and this uh, is relatively plain and probably uh, not too bad. Just a few uh, illustrations. Well, uh, this is what we would call. Uh, Exercice d'école, I mean, it's a school exercise kind of. So we took a tiny network, which is here. We divided it into these cells. 
So assuming that uh, these are anisotropic cells, and so we try to see how, uh, for example, a traffic wave propagates through this uh, network. So actually, when you look at the propagation, so uh, basically this is the figure that is done there on the right. So it is one of the cells in the middle. I think it is uh, this one that we considered. And in this cell, we only look at the directional flow. This is what is very important. And so directional density also. Uh, so it is a, the, probably this direction. It is direction one. And um, uh, basically, so uh, we look at this uh, di at the directional densities and directional flows. And well, actually, it yields what you would expect. A more interesting example is uh, this one. Uh, so this one was actually a project which was called the Traffic Pollu, which was a project essentially on the pollutant emission. And so uh, what we wanted to do was uh, to make a model of the area that is depicted here in the figure in the middle. Uh, so that's actually close to my office. It's in Mont la Vallée. Uh, so it's also one of these uh, very uh, dense areas. Uh, but you actually have a few major infrastructures which are more or less given here in the blue, uh, including also a public uh, public transportation. Well, I didn't insist on it. I wrote it on the slide. Actually, uh, when you talk about major infrastructures, we also think about uh, public transportation because a GSOI model can also be adapted to this context. Well, anyway, so I go back to my drawing. So what did we do? We needed to make a, a division of this area into cells. So actually, we did it uh, simply uh, by hand. This is uh, the more convenient. Uh, actually, even for a region like Ile-de-France, doing it by hand is actually not something absurd at all, because you have about an order of, say, 100 cells. So it makes sense simply to, uh, to do it by hand. Or you can take uh, um, earlier zoning efforts like um, the modus uh, zoning and then aggregate them. Well, in any case, here from Mont La Vallée, we did it by hand. So we got uh, those uh, nine cells and also some major infrastructure, uh, motorways. And then uh, we use this to actually calculate pollutant emissions and try to uh, what were the best. Uh, anti-pollutant strategies to apply on this uh, on this area, and so this was done with the uh, uh, Magister software. That's a software that's implemented on GSOM, which was coupled, as I've described in the previous slides, with a 2D model uh, for this uh, for this area. So actually, we have some uh, ongoing work that concerns this time the in the France case because there is an extremely strong demand of uh, regional authorities uh, also from local communities from the department and so on so there are many needs for this and uh, this is uh, in charge it's the DRIOA it's a state organization the direction regional interdepartemental the l'équipement and, and the l'aménagement which is means it's a direction for basically regional uh, uh, civil engineering transportation and so on. Well, and so uh, the proposed scheme is actually uh, more or less what I described, which is a 2D uh, model for the very dense parts and a 1D a GSOM model for the uh, uh, major infrastructure. So the scale is about 100 kilometers and the population is about 12 million. Well, that's it. So I'm uh, getting to what's the uh, hosting of my uh, presentation. Uh, so, um, so prominent features, uh, I think I would like to insist, is the fact that um, actually uh, uh, two, uh, two models that have to be combined. One is 2D model for the dense surface network and 1D for the major art. The other one is the fact that the 2D model at this point is essentially a phenomenological. It is cell-based. It is disaggregated by OD. And uh, you have the intercell, intracell flows that are calculated. And the tools are supply, uh, local supply and demand. So that inside cells, you have uh, directional flows. You have assignment. 
you have actually local ODs, which are essentially where you get into the cell where you get out, and you calculate basically the way the assignment is made by the this maximum principle. Well, you can have uh, anisotropy with no uh, problem, and basically uh, we propose also a bottom-up schedule to retrieve the macroscopic characteristics from the natural description. Very important. Now, PDE uh, formulation. Uh, okay, this is something uh, that we find is very interesting from a theoretical point of view. Uh, although, from a practical point of view, it's not so obvious. What you will expect is to have a system of uh, conservation laws which is uh, based on a two dimensional uh, space. And so these are notoriously uh, very difficult to analyze. There are not so many mathematical results on this kind of uh, objects. And so uh, it is very nice to know that it is uh, feasible. But I would say it will mainly serve as a guideline later on to make sure that the way we discretize and the way we make this uh, phenomenological models are kind of consistent. That is to say, if we change scale, for example, nothing bad happens. The model stays uh, consistent. Well, other thing is a DTA. And so um, a DTA is essentially carried out at the uh, cell level, that is to say that we look at demands from one cell to the other, but actually the modus network uh, is more precise than this. It gives us zones, and if you uh, remember, uh, there may be, uh, I don't know, uh, five zones in the cell, and so uh, then we might like to actually uh, redispatch the traffic to actual zones and not to uh, the cell uh, centroid. And so, um, uh, basically, uh, there is an issue of um, keeping track of the actual, uh, uh, say, a modus level uh, destinations. But this can be done. Basically, this information can be carried with the flow, essentially, as an attribute. And so, this is feasible. Also, if you want to do dynamic traffic assignment, you have to calculate travel times. And so, the good tool for this would be a flows. Well, I think uh, this is it. Uh, so this concludes my presentation. Well, I have also added some uh, literature, uh, which is basically a few uh, poor slides. So, OK, I have uh, with no uh, a claim at, at all to be exhaustive. Basically, it's more or less uh, what uh, I am uh, familiar with in this setup. Well, this is it, so this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I like those applauses. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for questions. It's not that there's a lecture after this. So, Feel free to type your question in the chat or unmute yourself and and ask. If I may start, from Patrick, I was curious of the connection with between this theory and the MFD approach. What is the relationship and are they compatible, et cetera? Well, I would say um, by and large they're probably uh, they're, I would say they're very they're very compatible compatible. Um, as far as I, uh, well, um, now MFD is evolving a lot, and so I'm not always keeping track of everything, but so I feel uh, MFD is now evolving fast, whereas towards uh, this not being uh, isotropic, as I uh, described it, but as actually considering uh, multimodality and so on. And so actually, from this point of view, from the modeling point of view, I think this is uh, getting pretty close to the concerns we are having. Um, now, I would say there is um, there are still a few uh, big differences. One difference is the way we actually want to retrieve the information from the, um, uh, from the network, uh, like uh, the way we uh, use this uh, bottom-up uh, approach. And I think 
that's one thing that uh, still distinguishes languages from one another. For example, this is also one important element that distinguishes what I've presented from the Moliere et al. approach and so on. Um, but these are uh, this uh, uh, pretty significant, uh, uh, pretty significant uh, differences. But uh, globally, there is uh, there is a commonality of uh, preoccupations, I would say, and uh, macroscopic. I see. So, I would say, uh, in the end, basically, uh, what will show is what is going to work. Uh, work more or less in practice because at this point all these models are not uh, very precise that's my that this is my feeling and this is why uh, one very important thing for us was actually to completely put aside the major the structuring infrastructure and to keep it separate from the rest so that we would actually um, uh, make no errors, not only because they are major infrastructure, but also because we usually have very good measurements of them. And so actually we can uh, keep a very good track of what's happening there. Right. right. We have a question from Edie here in the chat. Let me read it for you. From the point of yes, view... Yes, uh, uh, yeah, re regrettably, I'm not sure. Maybe if I uh, stop the sharing, I will be able to do something. Okay, I'm going to try it here, and then maybe I'll see. Yeah, I can read it to you. Yeah, From please read it to me. Theoretical interest only. Might there be an interesting PDE which results if one homogenizes across cells? Um, well, I tried to um, to answer this thing. So in, uh, so in order to write a system of PDE, uh, what you will have is uh, you you will have the conservation equations like so you will have something like a divergence like that and then you will have to add that some uh, phenomenological uh, part something that describes the behavior okay right and so this um, so that's the tricky part okay because um, there are two elements. One element is that the cells are full of intersections. So you have to do some averaging over all of these intersections. And then inside the intersections, you also have to um, uh, to describe um, how traffic flows through them. And so our idea, uh, which you have pursued, and actually we had made some trials in this direction, was actually to uh, to make these intersection models that are defined by some maximum principle, and so to try to uh, deduce something uh, from them. Well, uh, the, it, it is quite uh, it's quite difficult to uh, it's quite difficult to do. Um, uh -huh. So I think I think it is possible, but it is uh, I think it's possible. I think it's very interesting, but I don't think it's easy. Well, if it had been easy, it would probably have been done by now. But okay. Yeah. We have another question by Rafi. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Can you please explain the assignment component of the model? Do you look at the equilibrium at each time step? And if yes, how do you ensure the network wide equilibrium? Okay. Uh, well, I did. I didn't talk uh, about this at all. Because the model, as it is designed at this point, um, is designed uh, both to do um, dynamic traffic assignment in the sense of predictive, that is to say, calculate an equilibrium, right. or be used in a, a reactive context, that is to say. Uh, say for people who want to use it to give a recommend, travel recommendation or stuff like that in real time. Yeah. Um, so basically this is why this assignment coefficients are just there, uh, how to say, um, with, the, with the values that are assumed to be known and to come from 
or some other part. Uh, what does it mean? So this uh, assignment coefficients uh, essentially inside a cell will translate into fractions of traffic that um, go from uh, one entrance to one uh, exit. This is how you will uh, translate them, which means that uh, if you look at the network, essentially you will have some kind that they correspond to a path choice in a simplified network, the nodes of which are the cells. This is, uh, this is what it means. Now, you can calculate, uh, well, we have never done it, but this is how we would do it. We would calculate the equilibrium of the network given uh, simply this simplified network, that is to say the, um, the cells, the, plus also the major infrastructure, which we should not forget, which will also contribute. So that would be the uh, idea. Uh, now, in either for uh, equilibrium, that is to say for predictive, then you would uh, have a kind of a meta model that would uh, calculate you some uh, equilibrium. Or if you calculate uh, predictive assignment. Now, the big issue uh, in this is uh, basically the travel times, which is what I I mentioned in my last comments, which is uh, this is uh, the really uh, tricky time to uh, tricky aspect in this whole thing. Uh, you have to retrieve the travel times to be able to do it. Right, but the framework you're proposing, <laughs> well, in the sense that with the gamma coefficients, you can put any assignment you want, right? Exactly. Exactly. Basically, you have to relate. You have to this uh, gamma. Uh, will translate whatever assignment calculations you have made at some other level. You have right. to translate it into those gammas. Exactly. So, okay. yeah. We have another question from Nicholas Geroliminis. Great presentation, JP. How the 2D models can capture heterogeneity of dense urban networks in two-way streets. For example, when in the morning peak direction towards the center are congested, but the other direction is at low densities. Okay, this will uh, essentially uh, be uh, seen at two uh, levels in the, in the model. One, uh, say, uh, in the uh, intercell the flows. So if you look at cells, uh, if you look at the cell boundaries that are perpendicular to the direction where you have a little flow, uh, basically uh, in those directions also you will have little density. Uh, basically this is a recapture through this uh, internal uh, densities of the, the cells. Uh, now if you have uh, in another direction dense traffic in that direction you will have uh, uh, very high numbers of vehicles, you will have uh, very low supplies, uh, high uh, demands, and so on. And so actually you will have uh, congestion in those uh, directions. Uh, this is more or less uh, how it goes. So basically it is recaptured through the uh, different uh, numbers of vehicles and different densities inside the, each uh, cell. That's actually the point to be able to do. That's the point of the way the variables have been defined. Excellent. All right. I have lots more questions, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to stop recording now, and maybe we can continue after. All right, so first of all, let me thank again our great presenter today, Jean-Patrick Lebac, and to all of you for joining us today. Our next webinar would be in two weeks going to be by Irene Martinez from UC Irvine talking about the location of variable speed limits. So keep an eye on your emails. All right, everyone. Thank you all again. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jorge. All right. Are you sure you want to stop meeting highlights and recording? Yeah, I'm trying to see a